Right, I think there's still a few people coming in. I'll start, I'll kick off. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, all party parliamentary group on the environment meeting on uh, trade and uh, the environment. I'm Anthony Brown, the chair of the uh, APPG. Um, this is one of the most critical issues actually facing the UK at the moment. It, does, it gets a fair bit of press coverage, but isn't often uh, discussed in great depth. Um, that we are uh, you know, fifth, sixth biggest economy in the world, suddenly entering out uh, lots of trade agreements with different countries around the world, uh, you know, huge uh, economic consequences to that. We're also uh, president of uh, COP26 this year, and the government is committed to promoting uh, higher environmental standards, not just um, going net zero ourselves, but also uh, helping do that uh, internationally. Uh, and the key, one of the key issues here is whether we can use the trade agreements that we are starting to sign with other countries around the world and uh, obviously negotiating with many countries, whether we can use that to promote higher environmental standards around the world, uh, or at least not undermine uh, environmental standards, both at home uh, and abroad. And this obviously all has to be done in the context of uh, domestic politics, but also uh, under the rules of the World Trade Organization, uh, where there's a lot of discussion within government about uh, how much they do or don't constrain your ability to put uh, environmental clauses in uh, in the in the agreements. Um, I'm actually delighted to have three of the world's uh, uh, top experts. I think I'm right in saying on this on this uh, very issue. Uh, they've all got their own different associations, but they they also work for the Centre for International Sustainable Development uh, Law, which has been focusing on these issues for the last uh, twenty years or so. Uh, they are, um, I'm going to just read their names so they can give themselves full uh, introductions, but Professor Marie-Claire uh, cordonnier Sega, uh, who's uh, jointly between Canada and, uh, and the UK, but at Cambridge University at the moment. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Marcus Gehring, uh, who's also at the University of Cambridge there and is physically in Cambridge. Uh, and then we've got Professor Ilaria Esper, uh, who's uh, in Switzerland, uh, I think actually physically in Lugano as we speak. Uh, and um, she's uh, also the World Trade uh, Institute uh, in Bern, and again, has been specialising on these issues for the last 30 years. Uh, they've actually coordinated their presentations, which is a, a first here from me as chair of the APPG. Uh, so I'm just going to hand over to them, and they're going to talk for uh, 15 minutes uh, or so uh, about the different issues. They've got uh, some slides, which they'll talk to, uh, and then uh, we open it to Q&A. And the normal rules apply, obviously. If you're not speaking, please mute yourself. Uh, and if you've got questions, and please do have questions, I want as many questions as possible, uh, please put them in the chat, then I can uh, read them there. So with no more ado, I'll hand over to uh, Professor Marie-Claire. Thank you very much, Anthony, and uh, good afternoon. This briefing is on Global Britain, UK environmental leadership through trade deals. Next slide, Freedom, if you don't mind. We're just going to give you a short briefing on trade deals, the environment and sustainability in three parts. I'll cover crafting more sustainable trade treaties in the global green economy. And then I'll hand over to Dr. Marcus Gary, who will look at advancing climate change priorities in two of the most important and significant deals that the UK is currently looking at, the UK-EU TCA, and of course, the negotiations with the US. And then our colleague, Professor Ilaria Espa, will look specifically at the WTO and the UK's position in the WTO from a Swiss and international perspective, seeing as uh, now the UK does share some common uh, situations with Switzerland in the WTO and other global trade negotiations. And she'll especially focus on renewable energy transitions and carbon price commitments. Next slide, please. I'm currently, as Anthony asked, serving as the uh, Leverhulme professor here in the University of Cambridge, partly because over the last 20 years, I've been leading a study of about 170 trade agreements between different countries that address environmental issues in one way or another. Um, that study is being published this year in the, with Oxford University Press, and uh, I think it will come out in July. And um, it especially looks at what kind of trade agreements we're signing today and how we can make them more sustainable and more aligned with our Paris Agreement and Sustainable Development Goals. Um, I've previously served not just as a senior or general counsel to various treaty negotiations, but also as head of international affairs for Natural Resources Canada, um, originally British, but raised in Canada, helping to negotiate trade agreements on behalf of my country. And of course, also assisting in the impact assessments. So we'll move to the next slide. <clears throat> 
I think the first point that I'd like to give in a five minute briefing is that more informed trade law and policy is possible and that this would hopefully be of interest to parliamentarians who are signing deals and, uh, and approving trade policy. Analysis, transparency and engagement can also especially be achieved through impact assessment. Impact assessment is a recognized trace policy and lawmaking tool. It's undertaken by the US, by Canada, by Switzerland, Japan, New Zealand, the EU, South Korea, Chile, indeed most OECD members. The timing and the responses of a good impact assessment do vary. You'll do some that are ex ante, that look at the actual trade flows that exist between a country, and then what would happen if projections are accurate and they double or triple. You can also look during negotiations, what would be the uh, adverse or even positive environmental impact of a particular provision, liberalization of environmental goods and services, for example. And there's monitoring evaluation that is done ex post the assessment where actually um, provisions that have been adopted, especially to mitigate um, negative impacts or to enhance positive ones, can find a way to be expressed in the trade agreement um, and then monitored for the uh, impact of the impact assessment, if you will, or the impact of the monitoring and management plan. This can lead to various new steps. It can lead to reporting obligations. It can also lead to policy response documents on the part of the government explaining how they address a concern or otherwise. The scope and methods also vary. Most impact assessments of trade agreements do look at the scale, the composition, the technique or other effects of a trade agreement. Scale being, of course, if trade flows grow, do the environmental impacts of the trade also grow? Um, technique and composition being more about the changes in the economy that are occasioned by the trade agreement. Those could, if it meant adoption more widespread of environmental technologies, for example, could be positive. There are other effects as well, and there's the opportunity for quantitative and qualitative analysis in an impact assessment. The factors that the impact assessments look at also vary. There's environmental assessment or review, there's human rights, social labor assessment or review that are done by Canada and the US. There's economic assessment that pretty much everybody does. There's also integrated sustainability impact assessments that are done. The EU does these, they're sort of seen to be the most advanced, but amusingly or ironically enough, the leadership of the SIAs as a methodology, uh, even in the drafting of the handbook in 2016, was almost entirely provided by UK um, experts and academics, including in the University of Cambridge. Um, I think Marcus Gehring was involved in it and, uh, and, and also the University of Manchester. So the EU has adopted a UK sustainability impact assessment procedure that they use. Um, and it's normally done in three phases. First, there's a scoping, then there can be a finding of no significant impact, or there can be a finding of some impact. There are public consultations where people have an ability to express their views. Um, Parliament is usually consulted. And then there's a full assessment with a report that's released. It can be voluntary, it can be legislated. Canada does it by cabinet directive, the US by executive order, the EU by regulation. Some countries has laws that lay out exactly what's expected. What will be Global Britain's approach now that the EU is no longer doing it for you? How are we going to shape a world-class best practice IA procedure for the UK? If the February 2021 Japan UK impact assessment is the model and it's the only one we've seen so far, how could we build on the promising but fairly scant um, and preliminary consideration of the environment, climate or sustainable development aspects of that new treaty? Next slide, please. In our research, and I'm going to end with these two slides, we've looked at the innovations that are already in practice and how they're working out. Trade agreements are not all one shape or one size. And most countries, when they sign a trade agreement, I'm sure the UK is going to be no exception, have certain things that they're looking for. Alignment with their climate change policy, increased flows in certain key goods or services. And there are tensions that arise in this regard. Three in particular. The first tension involves situations in which new trade liberalization obligations constrain the adoption of new regulations to meet international commitments on sustainable development. They make it more difficult to implement the Paris Agreement, for example, which would be awkward. The second tension involves pre-existing social and environmental challenges that can be indirectly exacerbated by the economic growth that the trade and investment occasioned by the new treaty brings. 
in this case, it's mainly a question of lack of domestic capacity to enforce and enact adequate environmental and social regulations that then spill over into trade impacts. The third and most challenging tension involves situations in which trade and investment agreements may encourage economic development in sensitive zones, obsolete technologies, or economic sectors that states have multilaterally agreed to start phasing out. So a trade agreement that completely privileged, privileged coal, for example. Um, what would be the point, given our other discussions? So looking at new trade agreements, we can see actually four different categories of innovations that are particularly fascinating and that address these tensions through the text of the trade treaty itself, as well as the use of a good impact assessment. In the first category, addressing the first tension, the regulator finds exemptions from trade rules where these might otherwise constrain regulators or policymakers, mitigating the effects. So essentially, it's a sort of a do no harm technique. And this could be anything from general exceptions that are found in the WTO to specific exceptions where countries have particular technical barriers to trade that are there for good reason, or explicit non-application notes by the parties. This does not apply to this tiny little island where everything is done through government procurement. And um, even general interpretive statements such as we've done under NAFTA to prevent our investment rules from being um, misused. In the second category, which addresses the second tension and has become much more prevalent than one might expect, the regulator finds provisions that can permit or even prescribed mitigation oriented social and environmental cooperation activities among the parties to strengthen domestic environmental and social laws. And the third and final category is essentially the type of um, uh, commitments you can find in a trade agreement that actually look to enhance trade in sectors that contribute to sustainable development. And this is the kind of example that I've pulled out for you today on these, this chart. So, for example, we can find in the CPTPP the sustainable fisheries provisions, or we can find in the new EFTA states and Indonesia FTA sustainable forest management provisions. In Canada EU's SETA, we've got a lot on transparency and accountability and also commitments on climate change. Next slide, please. Similarly, in the USMCA that replaced the NAFTA, we even have a claims tribunal, which allows countries to allege non-enforcement of international laws and examples where someone has actually tried to lower standards in order to attract investment. And then in the EU Japan FTA, we have conservation of biodiversity provisions. In the New Zealand China, Chinese Taipei FTA, we can see the promotion of green goods and services. And in the new agreement on climate change, trade and sustainability, we can even see a focus directly on what can trade do if the primary objective is to encourage action on climate change and achievement of our Paris Agreement obligations. So the reason I put TBD there is that I very much hope if you take anything away from my brief conversation today, it would be one, what does our impact assessment look like and how can it build on the very best practices, especially since they came from the UK originally? And second, why don't we join the ACCTS negotiations and shape them to fit where we wanna go next? Thank you. Marcus? Thank you, Mike. Carry on, Marcus. Thank you, thank you Mary Claire. Uh, thank you, Anthony. Uh, my name is Marcus Gehring. I teach international and EU environmental and sustainable development law at the University of Cambridge. I'm a fellow of the Lauterbach Center for International Law and an expert in the Center for European Legal Studies and a fellow of Hughes Hall. And uh, Today I'm speaking in my capacity as uh, the uh, lead counsel for sustainable trade law. Uh, we've done a couple of studies on trade and climate change, uh, first in preparation for Brexit, but then also in following up and broadening it out. Our latest study was published by the Commonwealth Secretariat on trade and climate change and investment provisions uh, affecting Commonwealth countries. Um, these debates didn't start today. Uh, in the millennium round in the year 2000, Japan, for example, proposed a Kyoto waiver. So a waiver for all climate actions related to the Kyoto Protocol. Now, we all know that that round of trade negotiations never materialized. So many countries have taken to bilateral trade agreements. Uh, the first most progressive was the EU-Japan trade agreement, which really not just referenced the Paris Agreement, but insisted on the implementation. And I'm happy to say uh, 
that uh, the uh, two relevant provisions, Article 16.4 and Article 16.5, have been rolled over into the UK-Japan 2020 agreement. So the UK vis-a-vis -vis Japan has a commitment to not just uh, recognize that the Paris Agreement obligations exist, but to effectively implement those agreements and to facilitate trade and investment uh, that uh, helps in the climate change and trade uh, relationship. And I think it's important to say that these are not just window dressing obligations. No, they don't lead immediately to trade sanctions, but violations of these provisions could lead to a significant uh, loss of faith um, in the international community, as we've seen when the EU used uh, these expert committee provisions uh, uh, in a dispute with South Korea on the imp implementation of ILO uh, labor rights conventions. And South Korea, I'm sad to say, lost with flying colors. Um, this triggered significant uh, domestic debate, but it also triggered international debate. So these provisions shouldn't be taken lightly. They should, uh, we should pay attention to them. Freedom, if you go to the next slide. Um, as an EU migrant who moved to this country almost 20 years ago, I'm uh, slightly skeptical of Brexit. But if I see one really positive aspect, it is the Trade and Cooperation Agreement, the TCA, because the Trade and Cooperation Agreement climate provisions are unparalleled. They constitute the absolute new high watermark in free trade agreements. And I would hope that Global Britain uses some of these provisions or aspects of these provisions in future trade relationships with other partners. So uh, for example, you have um, uh, Comprof 5, the numbering might still change uh, of this provisionally enacted treaty, but uh, for now it's Comprof 5, uh, where we see that the fight against climate change is uh, one of the essential elements of the treaty and underpins the treaty. And it defines uh, and, and declares that climate change represents an existential threat to humanity. Language matters. And this, this language in particular, it's very hard to say someone has violated an essential element of a treaty. But nonetheless, having this as a backstop in a treaty project is very important. Uh, and, and then we have uh, quite a few non-regression or so-called level playing field provisions and the accompanying climate change definition. For example, um, uh, the commitment by the UK and the EU to the old um, 2030 targets, they're enshrined. And so falling under these targets could trigger the uh, level playing field um, expert process. And uh, I've written a little blog on this um, uh, where you can see more on the analysis on uh, trade and environment of the TCA. Freedom, if we go to the last slide. Now, you might wonder, what does that mean for the relationship with the United States? Now, under the new Biden administration, unfortunately, the already seven rounds of uh, trade negotiations between the UK and the US have been put on hold. But the new US trade representative has said that she loves the USMCA provisions. So I've just highlighted where they touch on climate change. USMCA recognizes the important role of multilateral treaties, recognizes measures to control air quality, and most importantly, institutionalize the uh, uh, submission for enforcement on enforcement matters process, the SEM process, before the Commission on Environmental Cooperation, where citizens of each of the three partner countries can submit alleged violations of those countries' own environmental laws to a public process that then can lead to, um, uh, to a condemnation of a certain practice. And if I had one sort of take home message for UK parliamentarians is uh, 
take citizens and citizens mobilization, even for trade treaties and investment treaties, very, very seriously. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then finally, we've got uh, Professor Ilaria from Switzerland. Good afternoon from my side as well, and thank you so much for organizing this session and having me here. So I am Professor Ilaria Espa. I teach at UZI Lugano International Trade Law and Environmental Law and Policy, among others, and I'm also a Senior Research Fellow at the World Trade Institute and Lead Counsel in the Natural Resources Program at CISDL. So, um, in the next five minutes, I would like to complement the first two presentations by switching from the preferential angle uh, to the multilateral angle. And the reason is that um, although the WTO may not be perceived as the real center of action, uh, especially lately, uh, trade and climate change and more generally trade and environmental sustainability is actually high on the agenda of the WTO as well. And I would just like to highlight that there are a number of uh, current initiatives that are going on that really proactively seek to find ways to better align the trade regime with climate change priorities. Now, this is not only reflected in the intensified activities of the CTE, the Committee on Trade and Environment, which is uh, now under a new renaissance, but uh, also in a number of initiatives to which I think the UK could really uh, very well contribute. And I'd like to mention uh, uh, the structured discussion on trade and environmental sustainability uh, to advance work on these topics that's been launched following a communication on the topic uh, late uh, last year, uh, which was sponsored by 50 WTO members, uh, including the United Kingdom. And this initiative really seeks to propel new ideas on a wide range of, of topics based on a very ambitious work program uh, that really goes from promoting a global circular economy to securing green financing for the smallest and poorest countries uh, to uh, topics more immediately related to the trade and climate change agenda to which I'm going to about which I'm gonna be talking just in a few minutes. But uh, more generally, I do believe that uh, within this um, new space, uh, there's of course room for the UK to play a progressive role uh, within the CTE and this recently launched uh, initiative. Um, the UK has also been playing a key role with other related initiatives launched within the CTE, such as, for instance, the informal dialogue on plastic pollution and environmentally sustainable plastic trade. So this could serve an opportunity to really make a difference in the a uh, very topical debate on how to um, really better seek um, stronger linkages between the WTO and climate change. This is something that uh, the WTO is really perceived as a very urgent matter, especially now that WTO is facing an existential crisis. And I really um, uh, do um, urge you to look at the WTO as a forum that uh, is really keen uh, to proactively act on this topic also as a matter of avoiding um, uh, definitive, um, let's say, uh, to be sidelined <laughs> in a way. So, uh, Freedom, if you could go to the next slide, I'd like to give you three concrete examples uh, where uh, the work at the WTO uh, could really uh, play a role also with respect to further alignment with the uh, climate change agenda and the COP26 agenda. You see here three uh, main points. Uh, the first um, is really the Environmental Goods Agreement, the EGA. Um, so uh, the negotiations have been going on for a number of years. They seem to uh, be uh, really uh, on the verge of being concluded uh, late in 2017. Uh, then uh, um, uh, there have been a few problems with respect to closing the deal. Uh, but uh, again, very interestingly, within the full program on uh, the structured discussion, uh, this is really key on the agenda. And uh, really, it is about accelerating uh, the final stretches and closing the deal, uh, which is going to bring a further deployment of climate change technology and more generally environmental uh, technologies. 
Uh, then the second issue is fossil fuel subsidies, uh, which of course is very much related uh, to climate change due to the magnitude of fossil fuel subsidies. Now, there's been action already at the WTO within uh, the latest uh, ministerial conference, uh, the 2017 fossil fuel subsidy reform ministerial statement already signaled the willingness of at least the coalition of the willing uh, among the WTO members to really uh, accelerate action on this respect with um, not only uh, with regards to the rationalization and the phasing out of inefficient fossil fuel subsidies, at least the most egregious form of fossil fuel subsidies, but also very importantly on the transparency uh, with respect to these subsidies that it still remains uh, um, a, very, a very big issue. Uh, and uh, the ultimate point would be uh, to achieve consensus on how uh, to expand the category of prohibited subsidies within uh, the SEM agreement, so the agreement on subsidies and countervailing measures. And again, very importantly, within the work program, this issue figures prominently. Um, uh, last but not least, the very contentious issue of border carbon adjustment. Um, here, I think it's very uh, already very important that uh, within uh, the work program on trade and climate change, there is explicit mention of finding ways to collaborate on schemes addressing the carbon content of trade products. And this is actually very important, not only because it signals somehow um, a, a, a willingness uh, to debate on what to do with respect to uh, uh, somehow closing the gap that's uh, um, now very prominent in terms of heterogeneity of uh, carbon constraints on the part of different members, but also with respect to the possibility to accommodate within uh, existing rules at the WTO for so-called non-product related product and process methods uh, measures, PPMs. Uh, and here, of course, the issue is really to collaborate on ways uh, to um, really determining carbon footprint of products in a WTO proof uh, way. Um, there are ways um, to do that. <laughs> now, uh, probably I don't want to bore you out with details, but just to say that uh, it is much more of a matter of legal design and WTO a priori does really not stand in the way in finding a, a, a reasonable uh, methodology for for designing um, carbon content based measures that could accelerate the climate change action. Um, so just uh, a few, uh, uh, two uh, takeaway points, um, not only trade and climate change is very high, high on the WTO agenda as well and seeks to promote proactively uh, uh, somewhat an advancement uh, in the debate um, and to accommodate uh, for most innovative instruments that could serve to harness trade uh, and climate change. But uh, in most cases, finding a multilateral solution remains um, really a first best. Uh, to achieve greatest influence and impact. And I'm just going to give you, for instance, the example of fossil fuel subsidies. I mean, it is certainly very welcome to achieve uh, uh, innovations in an incremental way through PTAs, but then due to MFN like spillover effects, of course, um, uh, it is best then to multi multilateralize these solutions in the very interest of the countries who are pioneering these new solutions. And then the second, um, Really, the, the, the final message is really please do not think the WTO may stand in the way. It's very really clear on the part of uh, um, uh, WTO that, uh, that we need to uh, really strengthen the links and the strength and mutual supportiveness between trade and climate change. And there's always a legal design that's going to allow uh, to really act on climate change in an ambitious way that is also WTO compatible. Thank you so much for your attention and look very much forward to the discussion. Well, thank you, Ilaria. Thank you very much. Um, you'll probably get, get, get rid of the screen share now so we can all see each other uh, better. Um, as I said, please do put uh, questions in the chat. I've got a couple of pre-submitted questions, but I'm going to abuse my chair's uh, privilege by asking some uh, at the beginning. And thank you for those uh, fascinating presentations. And I have to say, I found it um, sort of reassuring uh, that there is actually a lot you can do with trade deals to promote uh, environmental standards. And uh, I didn't realise actually there was such strong environmental measures in the UK EU uh, um, agreement, for example, I didn't realise the the work that's going on at the WTO uh, to do that. So my, my first question um, 
chair's question is to uh, uh, to Ilaria. Um, I have, I mean, you said the WGO doesn't stand in the way and it's got a key role to promote this, and that's good, good to hear. Uh, I mean, very good to hear, because often when I have had discussions about uh, uh, using trade to promote environmental objectives uh, with colleagues, they often cite Sorry, I'm not a trade expert. You, you mentioned the terminology for it that, uh, oh. that the, the WTO says you, it, uh, the trade, you can only judge things by the standard of the actual product itself, not in the process used to make it. And that to do that is deemed protectionism. Uh, is that a misunderstanding of WTO rules or have WTO rules uh, changed? Shall I take that or are we collecting the... the do, do you want to take that, that first? And then I've got a question oh, for Marcus sure. and a question for Mary Claire as well. And then, uh, as I say, open it up and everyone do your questions in the chat or if you want to ask them. Yeah. Okay. Um, great. Thank you so much for your question. And indeed, uh, it's not really a misunderstanding. I think uh, uh, the matter of concern really arises out of the fact that we do not have... Um, clear rule that explicitly say that we just have an interpretation on these rules through a consolidated uh, uh, body of jurisprudence now uh, that really tells us that uh, ppm based measures are uh, allowed of course if they are drafted and designed in a certain way of course but we do have explicit endorsement of unilateral measures even if they have extraterritorial effect ever since the u.s shrimps um, um, of jurisprudence, and this has gone a long way through the U.S. tuna to uh, disputes uh, until um, until uh, U.S. Uh, until EC seals, for instance. So we do have sort of a long record of uh, of of um, uh, jurisprudence, of course. Um, we can enter into the debate in whether we want to provide uh, much more legal clarity uh, uh, to members, because of course, depending again on how the measure is legally designed, and there are many technicalities in these very complex measures, which uh, are carbon content based, of course, um, whether the specific legal design will pass the different tests that are entailed, both in the non-discrimination test, uh, um, uh, and uh, of course, if this is not flying, uh, uh, through the environmental exceptions that are there. Uh, but uh, with respect to uh, these, I think there's, uh, there's, uh, there's now a, a relatively um, general understanding that uh, if uh, the measures are really crafted in a way that it's meant to really uh, primarily achieve environmental goals in terms of avoidance of carbon leakage, for instance, rather than hidden protectionism, uh, they're going to fly. Uh, I mean, WTO has also a long record of jurisprudence trying to avoid environmentally unfriendly outcome, even outcomes that would have been probably misunderstood due to the technicality of WTO. I could give you examples, for instance, with respect to WTO disputes targeting renewable energy subsidies as well, where, you know, the appellate body sort of found like its own convoluted, sophisticated way to really avoid a very even politically dangerous outcome, uh, because nobody would have probably the time to read 200 pages of appellate body report, which really explain why it had to condemn a renewable energy yeah. subsidy, uh, right? Uh, but um, yes, I hope this answers your questions, but I'm happy it, to- It does, no, that it, and, it, and uh, you could, your point about there could be greater sort of legal clarity on it. I certainly think from a UK perspective, there could be, because it sounds like a lot of the conversations we've been having, we, we shouldn't really have been having. Um, so my, coming to the questions from uh, that are starting to come in, a question, a follow up for it to, um, to Marcus uh, on the UK EU deal. I mean, you mentioned some of the language there and, I, and that's again reassuring that there is that environmental language in there, which I, I must admit I didn't realise the discussions we've had tend to be about tariffs and so on. Um, the, uh, my, my question is really is what the impact that language will have, because some of it was about having regards to and uh, etc, which isn't really legally enforceable. Uh, would that have real, what, what, are the, what are the enforcement mechanisms in there? And will they really uh, be able to change environmental behavior? Yeah, that's a, that's a fair question. And I know that some members of the environmental community um, sort of think only if it's subject to the trade dispute, i.e. the dispute settlement uh, part that can lead to trade sanction, do these environmental rules really have, um, have uh, a lot of weight. I completely disagree. I think the expert process, having a separate process that doesn't lead to um, trade sanctions, but can lead to naming and shaming, 
can in some ways even be more powerful because a panel will always hesitate before they authorize uh, millions of pounds in, in allowable trade sanctions um, for an unquantifiable environmental uh, kind of lapses or environmental measure. Whereas um, an expert panel will, I think, with greater, greater clarity declare whether the trading partner has been complying with the, with the trade rules or not. You're quite right, Anthony. Um, the, the, the dispute settlement process in the TCA is varied. Um, there's even the possibility of unilateral measures. <laughs> if, uh, for example, you move far away from a kind of common core, but um, all of those are subject to, uh, to then, in the end, a trade dispute settlement process where independent arbitrators decide. And I think that is, in my view, that's much better uh, as a process, but uh, then, then having political weight for example, decide the issue. So do not underestimate uh, even provisions that are not directly subject to the trade part of the dispute settlement, but have some other process. And we see that in the, in the Paris Agreement in environmental treaties, naming and shaming is the rule of the game and it can work quite effectively. Okay, thank you. Another question for Marie Claire, actually, but I'm going to I'm going to move over to questions. We've got some questions coming in, so I'll get, go to those uh, first. And actually, I have one um, which was pre-submitted from Barry Gardner, but I'm not sure whether Barry, who's a uh, Labour MP, I'm not sure he's actually here. I can't see him. Are you there, Barry? You can ask it yourself. But I thought it was a, a rather good uh, question. So um, uh, Barry's not here, but I can ask on his behalf. I'm from his office. Okay, um, do, you to, do you want to ask it then? Yeah, so it was on um, investment treaties and essentially the problem of investor state dispute settlements. And would the panel agree that effectively the UK should not be advocating for these in, in any future trade agreements due to their negative impact? So I guess the most sort of one of the most prominent examples being the um, the Keystone pipeline in Canada, we saw Trans Canada issuing a um, asking for compensation from the US government for two billion, I think, back in 2016 when Obama um, attempted to ban the permit for that for that pipeline. So, just really wondering if the, if you, you're in agreement, really, that the UK should uh, be strongly advocating against uh, investor state dispute settlement uh, clauses in future treaties. Marika is nodding very vigorously. And, and that's a brilliant question. Thank you both to uh, Hayden and also to Barry's office. Actually, the, the 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 I'm going to be provocative here, and I'm going to say no, no. They should set a completely different standard for them. So rewrite them so that they actually support investment in the areas that we've all globally agreed are most important. And so that they, frankly, help us to uh, move away from um, uh, some of the areas where investment is no longer needed. Indeed, we're trying to transition the world economy into a completely different direction. Because um, simply leaving them out is too dangerous, ignores the way that they can work as a sword or a shield to allow people to make investments in areas where investment is needed. And, and I'm not going to be, um, you know, sort of neo-colonialist in my answer here. I'm just going to pick an easy nearby example where lots of us go on holiday, Spain. Renewable energy companies, including British ones, invested in solar power in Spain because the Spanish government was offering excellent tariffs and feed-in tariffs and all kinds of inducements. The Spanish government changed, decided to throw away all of those inducements. The companies, these tiny solar companies that had invested their shirt in this, looked as though they were completely going to lose. They used investor state arbitration to help the Spanish government to reconsider. And I don't think we should shy away from that. The world is globalized. We have a global economy. We put up barriers. It'll only be the people who can afford it and the ones who are richest that can do that. So instead, let's make sure that we agree on and actually promote both at the bilateral level and also at the multilateral level, investment provisions that push us in the direction that we want to go and push us to develop the technologies we need. Um, that being said, and this is the sort of big caveat, number one, I think we have to look very carefully about what we define as an investment that is in like circumstances. Because if you tell me that a solar power investment is the same as somebody doing an oil and gas pipeline, I will yeah. laugh. And second, 
of course, we need to look very carefully at the investment measures that we take in the context of the multilateral environmental agreements themselves, because that might be the best place for them. So sure, if you want, do include some investor state or some investment chapter in your trade agreement, but make sure it's aligned with the other global commitments on sustainable development that we have. And that's not so hard to do, assuming, of course, that in Glasgow, we managed to get an agreement on Article 6 and the Paris Agreement, and we're able to actually come up with our sustainable development mechanism. But if we can do that, we've got a win-win-win. And I will admit that that's probably not the environment, sort of justice, sort of trade um, uh, unholy trinity that um, um, uh, ex-president Trump used to talk about. He agreed, disagreed with all of them, <laughs> but 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 it is the beginnings of a step forward if we want to work together in a global economy rather than trying to shut down our borders and then hope that climate change doesn't drown our island. Sure, it's as long as it's the right sort of investment, I think, as long as it's green investment rather than not green investment. Um, I'm going to ask. Yeah come to um actually barry had a second question do you, want to, Hayden, do you want to come to that very quickly uh yes i think that might have been covered already i think it was just around how the whether or not on i guess the answer is yes the uk should be uh advocating for trade as a priority theme really for cop 26 and push should be pushing for that trade um as a priority area essentially i'd say trade finance and investment measures but let's do them in the multilateral climate change context Let's, let's get that sorted out. And, and honestly, the only time I've seen something akin to a standing ovation in the, in the UNFCCC, besides um, Cancun um, after, after Copenhagen, was when the UK, together with another government, in Marrakesh in the pre-COP, I was serving as general counsel of the presidency at that time, and stood up, I think it might have even been Archie from, from our office um, here, and, and, and he uh, stood up and presented a finance roadmap to help to deal with all of the questions of where are we gonna get the financing? How is it gonna be structured? Who knows anything about this? And it was the UK that put together the finance roadmap. It was being table dropped and it was a very good moment for this country. Um, and, and, and that is something that we don't wanna forget. If we're able to get our fingers around that article 2.1C of the Paris Agreement, the, the changing of financial flows, we will have done an immeasurable service to efforts to address climate change. And frankly, we might be one of the only ones who could. You know, it's not something that Fiji felt comfortable trying to solve, is it? They were working on oceans and that was probably the right theme for their COP. Here, if we can figure out finance and the trade and investment that is part of that, a small part, we'll have, we'll have done the world a service. And we're in a very, obviously the UK is in a very powerful position to do that. Sorry, Laurie, you very much. Thank raising you. your hand there as well. I just had like a further addition to Mary Claire's excellent uh, answer to uh, this question. And I would add a further reason why the trade should also be negotiated within the UNFCCC negotiation, negotiation process. And the fact is the correlation that there is uh, and the uh, coordination that there is between the WTO regime and the UNFCCC and more generally MEAs, multilateral environmental agreements. So if we come up with trade-based uh, solutions for ramping up ambition on the climate change front within uh, the multilateral negotiations on climate change, WTO even more so will not stand in the way because there's, uh, uh, there's uh, you know, that's enshrined uh, within international trade law that whatever solution is the result of multilateral negotiations conducted in good faith is going to pass uh, at least the test under the environmental exception. So we're going to be even on a safer side, even if, if there are, um, you know, incidental or trade distortive effects uh, uh, incorporated into trade-based climate change solutions. Okay, that's great. I certainly agree with that. Um, so we've got you. Ruth Bergen from the uh, Trade Justice Movement, uh, who I think is on the call. You, you've put several questions in the chat. I don't know if you were asked. It's probably better you ask them directly yourself. There you are. These are great ones. Uh, yeah. so I, I guess, um, thanks very much for the, the presentation. Um, I guess we have a slightly different perspective. Our perspective is quite critical of the um, impact that the WTO has been having. So yes, you have this body of law that in principle, PPMs are fine and, and so on. But what, what we see through uh, disputes like the Ontario feed and tariffs, the India solar power program, I mean, I mean, this is dispute after dispute, right? That 
actually what the WTO has a problem with is local content requirements quite often. And that if you look at what's needed nationally to achieve climate change ambitions, it's, the, it's, it's something that shows it, it's the just transition. It's that you can demonstrate that job costs in some sectors are, are replaced in others. And that actually, given countries are pursuing that sort of thing, um, actually UTO is posing a, a big problem. And, and the second point is just that very often the districts take so long and the sort of jigs that countries have to go through, and I've cited US China as an example, is again, it, it takes so long, I mean, decades to get this stuff sorted, that that's a problem. You know, we don't have decades to deal with climate change. But UTO is serious. Actually, I think there's an awful lot of movement that needs to happen in a very short space of time if they're going to demonstrate they can, they can be effective. Thanks. Right, who would like to respond to that? Laura, you Sure. I might let Marcus go first, actually, just because I know he's worked on this specifically. Uh, in terms Mar of Marcus, do you want to? Yeah, I, I, I could keep my answer quite short. We just, um, I can, Claire and I um, edited a book series with Cambridge University Press, I just published um, a book um, on local content requirements. I think even on that issue, there are ways around it. I know that the Canada Fit WTO uh, panel um, report or, or outcome has a bad reputation in environmental circles. I think it's actually astonishing because the, the underlying matter, the fact that the renewable energy market is completely divorced from the non-renewable energy market is revolutionary and very, very progressive, right? So we sometimes, I think uh, don't see that, um, yes, the progress in the WTO is small because the underlying language and the arguments used by the parties are not progressive, right? Uh, I was involved in the Vattenfall investment arbitration in the city of Hamburg, the first Vattenfall case. We couldn't convince the federal German government to argue climate change as a regional government. That was impossible because the German federal government was worried about the reputation uh, in the Energy SATA Treaty. So there are sometimes geopolitical reasons why a very good sustainable development argument is not made. And so ideally we set up a new sort of UK trade policy that allows for these renewable energy arguments to be made progressively. Okay. Anyone else want to add anything to that? I, I think the one other um, uh, consideration, because I really appreciate that Ruth's question comes from a practical on the ground. What do you do when you've got a political problem? How dare these trade people annoy us when we're just trying to fix climate change? Thinking about it as a global economy, local content requirements, they're not always very fair. They sometimes have to be more about privileging the ones who have the economic power to back something up than they are about actually taking into account where the resources come from, where the labor comes from, the traditional inequalities that have been there. So a global just transition might actually have a lot of questions to ask about some of the privileges that are being protected in, in the name of political reality. And, and I, I don't think it's the end all and be all. I think there are still a lot of places where um, just getting some good advice and crafting your measure properly would save so much of a headache. And it's worth it if it allows solar power panels to be cheaper and more accessible to everyone in Ontario, rather than just a couple of suburbs in Toronto that, that can afford it. So that would be sort of my, 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 my pragmatic political answer, which I think you were very fair in sort of asking for. Um, I noticed you have another question in the chat about investment. Anthony, do you want to take me to take that at the same time? Uh, yes, well, there's other questions we're coming to. So if you keep your answer short, Sure. Um, I actually did some of that research because I was really interested. You know, do, do investment treaties actually lead to investment? And there is very little correlation in certain instances, not just anecdotally, documented. And there's a lot of correlation in others in terms of firms being able to justify making investment, whereas before they wouldn't. What I think is more important is what kind of investment it, they're leading to. And I think if we look at that, and if we take seriously the lack of investment that is needed, 
I've, I've done some other studies on the trillions of pounds that we're pouring into um, pandemic recovery and whether or not those measures are aligned with our sustainable development goals, which, which are a massive gap that we kept saying we couldn't meet because we didn't have the resources. Um, I think that's the question we really can be asking about our investment treaties. You know, what investment is being privileged? And I'm not saying let's sit here in Parliament or let's sit here in Cambridge Ivory Tower and, and decide what we think everybody else needs in terms of investment. What I am saying, and I think this is why I, I ended up getting the Louvre Hume Award for these next two years in this particularly crucial time as the UK develops its trade investment policy with, with my new book coming out, is this idea that if we take it very seriously and we look at the places where we've made multilateral commitments, 197 countries have fought that battle already in terms of what we should actually be prioritizing for our investment, then, then the answers are so much clearer. It's not me and Cambridge saying, oh, I really like solar power. It's the entire UNFCCC over, as you said, the course of years of struggle that have actually come to an, an agreement on these issues. So I think those are excellent, excellent questions and they, and they need to be asked. Um, and I'm hoping I'm, I'm reaching towards some answers there. <laughs> excellent, yeah, no, thank you. Um, and I come with Sean Spears, who's, the, uh, who's asked a couple of questions. He's the director of the Green Alliance, which secretary at the APPG. So thank you very much for making it all happen. So Sean, do you wanna ask your questions? Yeah, thanks, Anthony. Thanks to the panelists for a fascinating discussion. Uh, uh, Marcus, in his enthusiasm for, for Brexit, um, praised the trade and cooperation agreement, which is, is, is kind of good on climate, good on non-regression, also has clauses to allow for progressive improvements of policy, which is pretty unusual. I have to say, I've not heard any UK government minister say this is the, going to be the great model for future trade agreements. So I wondered what, what chances there are of that, either from the UK or, or around the world. And also, where, where the TCA is pretty weak uh, is on nature. And, and you kind of hear climate routinely referred to now in the context of trade. Nature is sort of lagging behind generally in political discussions, but uh, is it anywhere in, in trade discussions? <laughs> Marcus, I think I was directing you, but other, other, the other two, if you want to come yeah, out. I'm, I'm happy to take the first part. Um, I think Sean's political observation is more a question for the parliamentarians and, and lawmakers in the room. Uh, I think you're quite right. I'm slightly surprised because uh, the UK runs the danger if, they, uh, if the UK agrees something completely different with say Canada or Australia, that in um, its commitment with the United Kingdom in the TCA, it might find it very difficult to fulfill some of the the, the climate provision. So a safer way for the UK would be to replicate or approximate the language, the very, very strong language in, uh, in the TCA. That would be at least my, my sort of legal advice. And you're quite right. Um, nature uh, is unfortunately in trade terms often, too often focused on the goods, on fisheries, on timber, on forestry, uh, rather than the, 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 the sort of uh, biodiversity all. Um, Mike Claire, I think, has done some research on this. Mike Claire? I'm still reeling at Marcus's enthusiasm for Brexit. Um, <laughs> I've never heard those two words in the same sentence before. Um, I'm actually going to agree with you there, Sean. And in particular, I'm not sure that we could make a good argument that trade investment increases in the current context are good for nature. And we're in a biodiversity crisis. Either we fix this or we don't deserve our trade agreements. I, I do think that you got to engage the world economy if you want to address climate change and that, uh, that a lot of our trade investment agreements could do a lot for climate change. But the way we currently grow without taking into account the actual value of nature, all of the different values of nature, to the point where wiping out species makes our GDP go up in key countries. That's, that's not gonna necessarily be solved by a trade agreement, but it at least shouldn't be exacerbated. So, so I think that's a very astute observation. If the UK with the policies that we currently have, um, and, and frankly, a green Tory constituency that is kind of unparalleled in most other countries, particularly the ones I know well, um, can't solve this one. No one can. So, so I'm, I'm going to put that as a place where we could actually fix this and everyone else would thank us for it. 
we'll try. That's quite a sober warning there. I, I certainly see that uh, line of argument. Um, I've just got a few minutes left. I just want to ask one last question, which is a point uh, I think it was uh, Ilari, I think you touched on, but on uh, 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 carbon border adjustment payments, um, which uh, where well, there's definitely discussion in the UK and obviously the EU has uh, come out and support it and Joe Biden has uh, uh, suggested, has mentioned it, raised it as a possibility. Uh, and, you know, clearly one of the issues we've concerned about domestically is that being undermined you know we don't want to just export our pollution and uh, you know clamp down on steel production here if it just means we have sort of more polluting uh, steel imports um what, what do you see as the prospects for that actually happening and are there any sort of legal barriers to it i mean it's obviously very difficult to get a global agreement on that all at once obviously i mean it's impossible you'd have to start small and expand it sorry my audio yeah. Yes, thank you so much for the question. And uh, indeed, uh, this is an extremely complicated issue. Uh, uh, the EU has, I mean, and the border carbon adjustment uh, debate has had its ups and downs. It's really definitely not the first time that the EU and the US have uh, threatened to actually make use of these instruments. But the EU seems uh, pretty determined now within the context of the Green Deal uh, to uh, design these instruments, bearing in mind WTO compatibility issues. And um, I think uh, that the prospects for a coordinated action, of course, is uh, definitely not uh, uh, immediately reachable. Uh, but um, yeah, some of the legal issues that are there, of course, have uh, um, to do, as I was just mentioning before, with the way it's actually designed. So there are a few issues there. First of all, um, you know, there's a trade-off between administrative feasibility with respect to really determining the content of uh, carbon content of the good. Um, so whether you use the st standardized benchmark or whether you use direct measurements, of course, normally there should be a combination of the two, um, right? And uh, of course, this leads uh, also to um, somewhat narrow down the coverage of a border carbon adjustment measure because you certainly cannot include very sophisticated goods for which uh, the production process is, is not harmonized. So um, I definitely see it more likely that the EU starts off very modestly with like just a few uh, standardized commodities, you know, very high energy consuming such as steel such as, um, you know, aluminum uh, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, and then, of course, the other issue is uh, which products coming from which countries do you want to actually be uh, get subject to the border carbon adjustment? Um, because, of course, that would lead to also methane uh, uh, compatibility potential problems. And, of course, you would need uh, to identify country attributes for including or not including products coming from that or the other or that other country and here of course there are possibilities for exempting for instance uh least developed countries or uh uh, also, you know, um, also not including countries which have comparable carbon constraints, but of course this is to be, you know, very carefully legally designed because in principle it has to be origin neutral. And whatever criteria that's underlining the choice of countries uh, origin, of course, would need to be climate change compatible. So, so, um, so of course, uh, for the purpose of uh, trying to be able to justify the environmental uh, oh, yeah. particular e, N, or G, non-discrimination does it, depending on whether non-discrimination have... arguments uh, fly or not. Um, I'm going to have to uh, wrap you up there because this is uh, one minute to five and we're going to finish at five. Can I just, uh, we've had a request from Mary, Mary Claire, as many people as possible turn on their cameras for a uh, uh, a little so if you're happy for your picture to be taken for social media uh purposes and she's got a one-line anecdote she wants to finish on and then i'll uh, quickly wrap up sure my one-line anecdote is that nafta in 94 came to canada and the environmental community was not ready and parliamentarians were not ready our level of economic literacy was probably in the negative numbers <laughs> and the nafta that we got we deserved Frankly, we got a better one than we deserved. Because we weren't ready, we took on that responsibility of a massive trade agreement of that type with a big partner like the US, and we didn't realize what the environmental impacts would be. I think the UK has a chance to do this differently with all of the new trade agreements that you're signing. 
Japan is supposedly third largest economy in the world. UK is fifth. That type of treaty should be signed with very, very great engagement of the environmental community. So my plea for everyone here, particularly after the embarrassment of the Canadian public, when we realized that according to an honest to God poll, nobody in parliament, only two, had read the NAFTA before they signed it. And you can imagine the scandal that that actually brought to us, is to prepare and be ready to ask the kinds of questions you've asked today because that's what will get us the better kind of agreement that brings us the global green economy. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for that. And that's uh, a good end thought because this is all part of the preparation, part of the role of the APPG is to raise awareness and debate of uh, environmental issues. And I, I've certainly found it a very enlightening uh, session, uh, not being an expert in, tra in trade agreements. Uh, and actually it's certainly heartening to see that the WTO is on the side of the angels on this and isn't, isn't an obstacle, but also that there are, uh, you know, many precedents and examples of uh, trade agreements actually promoting uh, environmental standards. And I think that's the sort of the main message and certainly can be a help in uh, climate change, if not in biodiversity loss. But uh, thank you, um, uh, Marie, Claire, Ilaria and uh, Marcus. Uh, been, they've been excellent presentations, great questions. Uh, thank you everyone else for attending here. And uh, I can't remember what our next event is, but we'll email you all and you'll find out. Th thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. Thanks, Anthony. All right.